Next year in 2023, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will be studying from the New Testament in their Come Follow Me courses. For the study guide, The New Testament of Jesus Christ, I have completed the annotated edition using the Joseph Smith translation using the 1867 first edition that was published by the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm the managing editor and Sean Hugh, the associate editor who completed all of the uh, texts uh, that Joseph Smith uh, um, annotated within the New Testament. The prophet Joseph Smith considered it so important a work that he called it a branch of his calling, and it took him longer than the translation of the Book of Mormon. Yet it could be that this work is the least appreciated and understood of the contributions of his ministry. What is it? The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. I think one of the first things to understand is that Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible is one of his first pieces of work that he begins after translating the Book of Mormon. Uh, you know, sequentially it, it goes from Joseph translates the Book of Mormon, gets it published in March of 1830, organizes the church in April of 1830, and by June of 1830 he's begun his Bible translation. So this is what he feels is his next step as a prophet, seer, revelator, and translator, is to try to make these uh, corrections uh, to the Bible. When Moroni visits him as a 17-year-old, Moroni quotes him Bible verses, and then Joseph even says, with some slight variation with how they read in our present Bible. So from the beginning, Joseph's getting this idea that the Bible as we have it uh, is not a complete, perfect record and that using his gifts as a revelator and as a translator, he is then directed by the Lord to go into that solemn, sacred text that's the foundation of Western society and make corrections. He says that he has learned through the revelations of God to him that there's many things in the Bible that are inconsistent with uh, the revelations of God to him uh, as it's currently found. While he was translating the Book of Mormon, he learns that there were plain and precious things uh, that are not in the Bible. Joseph's process to create the new tr translation uh, is unique in that he did not employ Hebrew or Greek sources, lexicons, or knowledge of biblical languages to render a new English text. Rather, he used an 1828 H&E Finney Company of Cooperstown, New York edition of the King James Bible, which included the Apocrypha the, as the starting point for his inspired revisions, dictating changes and additions to various scribes who recorded them, first on paper and later as notes in the margins of the Bible itself. His early work on the revisions resulted in long revealed passages that Joseph dictated to his scribes much as he did when receiving the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants. The Public Domain 1867 edition, the title page is shown here, how it appeared when it was first published uh, as the New Testament. Uh, I take the text and I then um, reformat it in, in a unique way. So, for example, the Joseph Smith words will be in bracketed, italicized text. So, for example, in verse 6, Then the devil came unto him and said, that's what Joseph Smith uh, used in his annotation. And then you'll see the words of uh, Satan now are in blue, italic text. The words of the Savior will be in, in red. And other elements that are familiar to you who have those who have purchased my other annotated editions will be uh, the same kind of uh, formatting. October 8, 1829. 
Oliver Cowdery purchased from Grandin's Press in Palmyra, New York, a large print Finney edition of the King James Bible. In June 1830, the prophet with the aid of the Urman Thummim received a revelation known today as Moses I. And that vision ends with the idea, sort of in the same vein as the first Nephi 13, that some of Moses' precious words had been taken away, had been lost, but that they would be brought again, brought forward again by a prophet. And that seems to be uh, a launching point for the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. It's hard to know if he intended to translate the Bible when that revelation came, or if that revelation was the catalyst. But at the very least, that revelation has become the starting place of Joseph Smith's new translation of the Bible. When I was back in college a million years ago, I worked at the Religious Studies Center at BYU on the transcription of the Joseph Smith translation manuscripts. And I've talked a little bit about this in, in other lessons, but uh, the church had some uh, amazing opportunities to be able to scan all the original manuscripts of the Joseph Smith translation. Those are still in possession of the Community of Christ, the former reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And through some, some miraculous uh, synergy between the two religions, our church helped their church with some preservation kinds of things uh, of the manuscripts because they're, they're getting old. And their church was kind enough to offer our church in return the, the rights to be able to scan all those images ourselves. And once we had the images, the next big project that BYU wanted to do was to make a scholarly transcription. Now, a transcription is different from a translation. Joseph did the translation. And the, the version that is produced by the community of Christ, it's called the inspired version, is an accurate uh, description or transcription of what jo the final result of Joseph's work on the JST. And we've got a ton of the important ones in our footnotes in the Bible, okay? But if you want an actual, this is what the, the final product of the JST looked like, then you can buy an inspired version from the community of Christ. But what the scholars wanted was not just the, the end result, they wanted to be able to see process. And for that, you got to see the manuscripts. And with the manuscripts, it's, it's amazing because you really see, you can almost envision Joseph and Sidney at work on this. And there are times where it just flows beautifully. I call it a Mozart masterpiece because Mozart was famous for having it already all worked out in advance. And his first draft was his final draft. Some of you are thinking, oh, that's how I always wrote my papers in college or in high school. It's like, yeah, that, you were, you were, we're not Mozarts though, okay? Your, your first draft wasn't supposed to be your final draft. Keep editing, revising, okay? But for Mozart, it's like, wait, why change it? I already did all the changes in my head. This, this is how it is. And there are places in the JST that it's like that. The Visions of Enoch in Moses 6 and 7 is a Mozart masterpiece. It's just like, write as fast as you can because uh, it's, it's coming. So I have here a calendar of 1830, and in red, I have the numbers of the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, and I have circled key sections as well as dates that relate to uh, events that are important in the translation process. So for example, on uh, April the 6th, that's when the uh, Church of Christ was organized on that Tuesday. And then in June of that same year, the inspired revision begins. And it starts with the vision of Moses he received in June. And then eventually from June through October, he then gets the writings of Moses, uh, which includes chapters 2 and 6. Now, I've circled... Um, sections 28 30 and 32 because <clears throat> part of his calling was to preach the gospel to the lamanites and zion shall be on the borders of the lamanites so that's part of his calling to take the book of mormon and to uh, establish the church among the lamanites and finally from november of the uh, and december of 1830 he gets the revelation known as moses 6 and then december 1830 moses 7. So in 1831, in February, that's when he completes uh, the uh, Moses chapters, that's Moses chapter 8. And then on the 9th of February, which is a Wednesday, he receives a section 42. And he says, Thou shalt ask 
And my scripture shall be given as I have appointed, and they shall be preserved in safety. And it is expedient that thou should hold thy peace concerning them, and not teach them until you have received them in full. And I give unto you a commandment that then shall you teach them unto all men, for they shall be taught unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. In addition, on the next month, on a Monday, which is the 7th of March, he gets a commandment to begin to translate the New Testament. And now, behold, I say unto you, it shall be not given unto you to know any further concerning this chapter until the New Testament be translated. And in it all these things shall be made known. Wherefore, I give unto you that you may now translate it, that you may be prepared for the things to come. As Joseph went through the Bible, he would have questions as he was translating and seeking to clarify that would then launch revelations. And that Bible translation launches Doctrine and Covenants revelations. These two projects are not separate. The Joseph Smith translation of the Bible and the Doctrine and Covenants are intertwined. Most of the basic doctrines that we teach about the church are things that spring out of that period from the summer of 1830 to 1833 when Joseph Smith is heavily involved in the, in the translation, what he would call the new translation of the scriptures. We call the Joseph Smith translation just to just to formalize it. During that time, uh, at, at any certain point, he and Sidney Rigdon come across a passage as they're studying the scriptures, they ask questions. The questions uh, prompt revelation, sometimes really small, sometimes really uh, large. The key thing, I think, is that from June 1830 when he starts to July 1833 when he finishes, um, essentially sections 24 to 97 of the Doctrine and Covenants are received. So we're, we're talking about more than half of the Doctrine and Covenants revelations come in this three-year period when he's working through the Bible translation, just a, a rich, full, revelatory period. So now we're into 1832, and it's now January 10th, 1832. On a Tuesday, he gets the following revelation. Now, verily, I send to you my servants, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, who is the scribe, saith the Lord, it is expedient, expedient to translate again, and inasmuch as it is practical to preach in the regions round about until the Amherst, Ohio conference, and after that it is expedient to continue the work of translation until it be finished. He then continues on the next um, section, which is now section 74, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were, were your children unclean, but now they are holy. The editors of the Joseph Smith History wrote that Joseph dictated this document in Jan January of 1832 in conjunction with his revision of the New Testament. A dramatic example is section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which comes when Joseph and Sidney go to John 5 and see a scripture about the resurrection. And this prompts them to receive uh, a vision that, according to other witnesses there, and there's 12 other people in the room, lasts about an hour and a half. So we're talking a, a feature-length film, basically, that shows Joseph and Sidney the eternity, starting with a vision of God the Father and Jesus Christ, then going down to a vision of Lucifer and the sons of perdition, then back up to the celestial kingdom, to the terrestrial kingdom, the telestial kingdom, and then wrapping it all up back together. So the, on that January is when he uh, and Signy were at the Amherst, Ohio conference. And then the next month on a Thursday, on the uh, 16th of February, Joseph Smith, while translating the Gospel of St. John, receives section 76. And upon my return from the Amherst Conference, I resume the translation of the scriptures. From sundry revelations which had been received, it was apparent that many important points touching the salvation of man had been taken from the Bible or lost before it was compiled. It appeared self-evident from what truths were left, that if God rewarded every man according to the deeds done in the body, the term heaven, as intended for the saint's eternal home, 
must include more kingdoms than one. Accordingly, on the 16th of February, 1832, while translating St. John's Gospel, it's in John chapter 5, verse 29, myself and Elder Rigdon saw the following, and then he gets section 76. Shortly after that, then, in the next month in March, he received section 77, which is translating from the book of Revelation. And here I have a page from the annotated edition of the New Testament that I have to show you how I treat that. In the same year of 1832, now we're into December 6, he is uh, going to make commentary on Matthew's chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, which relates to the parable of the wheat and the tares. And again, this is another insight page that I have in my annotated edition of the New Testament of the Joseph Smith translation. So now we're in the year 1833 and we're into February 2nd, which is a Saturday. And he then uh, writes the following. I completed the translation and review of the New Testament on the 2nd of February, 1833 and sealed it up no more to be opened till it arrived in Zion. Then in May, uh, we get the following. And verily I say unto you that it is my will that you should hasten to translate my scriptures. That's in DNC 93, verse 53. Then we get in July 2nd, the following. This is the preface to the 1867 first edition of the, of, the, of the translation. This work is given to the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and to the public in pursuant, pursuance of the commandment of God. As concerning the manner of translation and correction, it is evident from the manuscript and the testimony of those who were conversant with the facts that it was done by direct revelation from God. It was begun in June of 1830, and it was finished July 2nd, 1833. So here I have an example of a section he receives on May 6, 1833, uh, section 93. It says, And John saw and bore record of the fullness of my glory, and the fullness of John's record is hereafter be revealed and he bore record saying I saw his glory that he was in the beginning before the world was therefore in the beginning the word was for he was the word even the messenger of salvation the light and the redeemer of the world the spirit of truth who came into the world because the world was made by him and in him was the life of men and the light of man the worlds were made by him, men were made by him, all things were made by him and through him and of him. And so in the Joseph Smith translation of John 1, 1 verses 1 through 5, we see the following. In the beginning was the gospel preached to the Son, and the gospel was the Word. You can see in bracket in italicized text, that's the Joseph Smith annotation. And the Word was with the Son, and the Son was with God, and the Son was of God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made which was made. In him was the gospel, and the gospel was the life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shineth in the world, and the world perceiveth it not. So we can learn from reading what Joseph Smith wrote uh, back in July 2nd in 1833, where he uh, states the following. He says, Brethren, we received your letters June 7th, one from Brother William W. Phelps and Oliver Cowdery, one from Brother David Whitmer, and one from Brother Sidney Gilbert, for which we are thankful to our Heavenly Father to hear of your welfare as well as the prosperity of Zion having received your letters in the mail of today. We hasten to answer to go with tomorrow's mail. We are exceedingly fatigued owing to a great press of business. We this day finished 
the translating of the scriptures. So, no, Joseph Smith had completed the translation of the New Testament on February 2nd, 1833. The remainder of his Old Testament translation was apparently com completed on the day this letter was written, which is July 2nd, 1833. Today, the Community of Christ owns the manuscript of the Bible translation. Beginning in 1981, permission was granted for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to include portions of the Joseph Smith translation in their new edition of the Bible. Sometimes people say, well, we can't trust it because uh, the Community of Christ or the RLDS Church was the ones who published it and we don't know what's gone on there. Uh, number one, I think that's uh, inappropriate. It's condescending to our our cousins in the restoration. They've been great stewards and caretakers over the uh, Joseph Smith uh, translation manuscript. And when some of our early scholars, such as Robert J. Matthews, uh, did analyses of what the RLDS Church has published and what the actual manuscript translation says, they found that the, the publication that the RLDS Church did is highly accurate. There's some inconsistencies um, uh, that were done through editing, but, but that have been corrected. And the high majority of what was published is very accurate. Um, and then number three, our own church today has incorporated it into our footnotes, uh, into the longer excerpts at the end of our canonized scriptures. Uh, that's a signal to Latter-day Saints that we should be using this and relying on the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. So now we have section 124, where the Lord wishes for the new translation to be printed. This was uh, given to Joseph January 19th in 1841. And he says the following, if he, that is William Law, will do my will, let him from henceforth hearken to the counsel of my servant Joseph, and with his interest support the cause of the poor and publish the new translation of my holy word unto the inhabitants of the earth. And if he will do this, I will bless him with the multiplicity of blessings, that he shall not be forsaken, nor his seed be found begging bread. So we may ask this question, did Joseph Smith complete the inspired revisions? Well, Kent P. Jackson from the Department of Ancient Scripture at BYU from 1980 to 2017 stated the following, that Joseph Smith did indeed finish his inspired revisions by way of commandment. Quote, a misconception has survived among Latter-day Saints for over a century and a half, that is, that Joseph Smith never finished his Bible translation. A more recent misconception is that he continued to make modifications to it until the end of his life. Neither of these ideas is true. The evidence is clear that in July 1833, Joseph Smith finished his revision of the entire Bible, and he considered it ready to go to press either then or shortly, shortly thereafter. He then continues, Joseph Smith wrote to the saints in Missouri that he had finished translating the scriptures and from then on never talked or wrote of translating the Bible, but of publishing it. Jackson goes on to argue that later modifications to the text were primarily done by others. So who were the members of this new translation of scriptures committee? Well, I have a picture of them below, and here's what we read in the 1867 preface. Joseph Smith was born in December 1805 and was at the finishing of the manuscript of this work in the 28th year of his age. The manuscript at his death in 1844 were left in the hands of his widow, Emma Hale Smith Vitamin, where they remained until the spring of 1866 when they were delivered to William Marks, Israel L. Rogers, and William W. Blair, a committee appointed by the annual conference of April 1866 to procure them for publication and were by them delivered to the Committee of Publication, consisting of Joseph Smith III, Israel L. Rogers, and Ebenezer Robinson, and are now presented as they came into our hands. So on the bottom, we have a picture of Emma Smith, her son, Joseph III. Then we have William Marks, followed by Israel Rogers, and then Ebenezer Robinson. So I have now some representative pages with 
uh, the um, formatting I do with the Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament. And to the left, I have an introductory of who St. Matthew is. I do that for each of the Gospel authors. I also will show on the right um, how I format the genealogy of Christ by breaking it into the 14 generations that is referenced in verse 17, where there's 14 generations from Abraham to David, and 14 from David until the carrying away of Babylon, and then 14 from the carrying away of Babylon until Christ was born. I also show here that the um, when quoted scripture is uh, shown, it's in blue, and in this case, since it's a prophecy, it's been indented. These pages show how I treat uh, the King James Version of uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, which are the Beatitudes, how it looks compared to what Joseph Smith got revealed to him, uh, where you'll see all of his additional material in the bracketed um, uh, text that is italicized. I create another page to the right where I compare the Joseph Smith Matthew of uh, chapter 5, 1 through 12, and I compare it to what uh, Christ uh, said to those on the uh, land that's choice above all others on the American continent, where he teaches the um, Nephites the same Beatitudes, but shows the differences between that and those in Jerusalem. I also include artwork as you read the text in many of the pages, uh, and this is an example of that to the left. To the right, I also show sometimes a full page of wonderful art. This is by James Jacques Joseph Tissot, who is from France, and all of his work he did in watercolors. This page shows an example of what I have done to uh, highlight how Joseph Smith translation clarifies uh, what can be somewhat confusing in the um, King James Version of Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. If you look at verse 4 in the King James, you've got, And forgive us our sins, for we all so forgive every one that is indebted to us, and lead us not unto, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In this case, it, here it seems like the Lord is, Christ is saying to, to Heavenly Father to, to lead us not into temptation, whereas in the Joseph Smith translation, we can read in verse 4, And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and let us not be led unto temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and power. Amen. You can see where that really clarifies it. Also, he includes this additional uh, sentence, and Jesus said unto them, Your heavenly Father will not fail to give unto you whatsoever ye ask of him. So again, this is a wonderful way to uh, read the Joseph Smith additional material that he provides with his inspired version. Again, I show a couple more pages here in Luke uh, where I incorporate uh, artwork as you read the, the narrative. Um, and also the different commentation um, that is provided by those footnotes in the gold boxes and how they can enhance your reading and comprehension of the text. I continue with the same formatting with the Book of Acts by incorporating uh, artwork as you read the text that will give you greater comprehension as you read it, including also some commentations by theologians. In this case here, I have a picture of the Reverend Joseph Barnes. I changed the format when we get to the epistles. And here is an example in Romans where Paul is writing a letter to the Romans. So my format is not to have double columns, but to create the format to make it look more like a letter where I then have my insights uh, off to the right of those uh, that letter. Uh, to the right, I expand upon this area. Uh, you can see here in verse 9, uh, but this is false. If not so, that's from Joseph Smith. You can see that it's a talicized text in bracket. What then are men, are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have proved uh, in bracket before the Jew and the Gentiles are all under sin as it is written. So what's really intriguing is how I organize uh, 
as it is written. So I find the references in Psalms and in Isaiah, and then I provide in my format how he creates couplets. So for example, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now, this is what's interesting. He's going to take Psalms 5, 9 and say, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. Now he's going to go to Psalms 140, verse 3. The poison of ass is under their lips. Now he's going to go to Psalms 10, verse 7, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Then he's going to go to Isaiah chapter 59. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of the peace have they not known. And now, finally, he goes to Psalm chapter 36. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, this is a, an example of some uh, insights I have here off to the left are uh, a map of the seven churches in Asia that you'll read about in the book of Revelation. And also to the right is an insight of how those churches had different problems and uh, to him that overcometh how to overcome those problems in those churches, which becomes an almost an allegory to the problems that we may have in our life. I list all the commentators, and I have several that come from different religions, as well as our prophets and apostles from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as well as uh, sections from different uh, Bible um, commentators, as well as uh, Bible dictionaries and academics. Also to the right, I have a complete index uh, on different keywords and the pages those words are found. So my company is called Beacon Light Books, and it's all about illuminating sacred texts. I'm located here in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, where there are seven active lighthouses on the coast, the Outer Banks. The annotated edition of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the Joseph Smith translation, using the 1867 first edition, is now available. You can get them at Desert Book. Uh, other venues, uh, Digital Legend Press, you've got Firm Foundation, and Amazon, so forth and so on. The retail price at Desert Book is $74.95. You can also um, go to my website, which is beaconlightbook.com, and the price there is $65, it, and it includes shipping, and I will sign the copy for you.